Turn in your Bibles, please, the book of Numbers, chapter 20. The book of Numbers, chapter 20 tonight. While you're finding your place in the Word of God, let me say this, and I don't mean to make anybody mad, don't mean to cause anybody to get a little bit frustrated or anything like that, but I'm going to make a statement about the Lord that when I first say it, until you listen to the whole context, you might disagree with me. God is not fair. At no time in all of the Word of God does he claim fairness. He says he is no respecter of persons. He says he is a righteous judge. He says he is holy. He is without fault. He is without blemish. He is without guile. He is without error. All of those things are true, but he never claims fairness as an attribute, especially not in the way that you and I consider fairness. Think about this for just a moment. I don't want a fair God. I want a gracious God. I want a merciful God. I want a forgiving God. I do not want what I deserve for all eternity. I deserve hell like the worst sinner that's ever walked on the planet earth. I deserve hell, but because of his grace, I'm not going to get what I deserve. I'm not going to get what is fair. I'm going to get his grace and his mercy and his forgiveness. So we don't have a fair God. There's a reason I mention that because sometimes in the word of God, when you read a passage of scripture, you scratch your head just a little bit and you You go, well, that doesn't add up in my mind. It doesn't sound fair to me. Nothing has to sound fair to us as long as it's right in the sight of God. As we travel all over the place, and we've now been in over 1,100 churches, uh, oftentimes like this week, we're parked right here on the property. I have a key to the church. I can come in anytime I want. Sometimes we're staying in a prophet's chamber right there in the church. But almost every single week, we get a key to a church. And I do have to say this from the time that Pastor Coffee was pastor to today with Pastor Monteith, this may be the only church that I've never taken the key home with me. I have a dozen keys at home in a closet. But anyway, just to let you know that. But we often have a key. So I'm often in church buildings long after everyone else is gone. There are two things that are true in almost every single church building, whether here in the United States or in a foreign country. The first thing that you're going to notice about a a, a church building late at night when no one else is there is that church buildings are some of the scariest buildings on planet Earth. If you're in a church building late at night, they squeak and they creak and they make all kinds of noises. It sounds like someone's coming up behind you all the time. Church buildings, when you're here by yourself, are very scary buildings. But there's a second thing that they have in common. As you go through most churches and you go down through the Sunday school classes and all of that, some industrious Sunday school teacher of the little kids, the kindergarten, first, second, all the way up through fifth grade, has discovered that there is a secret way to motivate little little boys and little girls. Now, when they become teenagers, it changes. Once they become teenagers, there's one thing that motivates them and one thing only, and it's pepperoni pizza. You can get teenagers to do anything at all that you want them to do as long as there is some pepperoni pizza on the table for them when it's all said and done. I remember one time we were, I was a director of a camp in West Virginia. My nephew was actually my assistant director. And so we had purchased pizza for all of the campers that were there on that Thursday for lunch. They'd all gone through and got a few pieces. Then we opened it up for seconds and several of them went through the line for seconds. Now we found out that we had five pieces of pizza left over. We can't announce to 75 campers if you want thirds get in line because what if six of the teenagers get in line and you only have five pieces. So we decided, believe it or not, because I'm just this kind of mean person, we decided that the five teenagers that did the absolute most disgusting things could have those five pieces of pizza. I'll never forget a 13-year-old girl walked up. She brought a young boy named Christian with her. Christian was about six foot two and he had a size 13 and a half tennis shoe. She walked up with him. He walked up and lifted up his foot like this and set it on top of one of the tables. This little 13-year-old girl got down and licked the sole of his tennis shoe from the heel all the way to the toe. Two things happened at that moment. Number one, she got a piece of pizza. Number two, she made her daddy really proud. In case you didn't realize that was charity. 
but she did not win the most disgusting contest. What we do every single morning, we have cold cereal and juice. And after they would eat, of course, you can't throw all the liquid into a trash can to, for the trash. So we had a special trash can with a special liner and they would dump their leftover cereal and they dump their leftover juice and all of that. This boy walks up to that. Now, remember, it's one o'clock in the afternoon. We finished breakfast at 830. He walks up, grabs a 16-ounce styrofoam cup, dips it down into that big old trash can and swallows every single drop of it just to get one piece of pepperoni pizza. Teenagers will do anything for pizza. But the young people, back to where I was, the young people, there is something that motivates little boys and little girls outside of candy. It's a little gold star. I don't know who came up with that, but it's such an ingenious idea. And as you go from church to church, uh, invariably, you're going to find a, a, a chart in some Sunday school room. And the chart's going to have all the names of all the boys and girls down through the, like this. It's going to have a grid with all the different dates on there. It's going to have a section that you get a gold star if you brought your Bible, if you brought a friend, if you, uh, if you were faithful on this Sunday, if you were here, there. And there's always one little kid that has one little star way down over here all by himself. But then there's that other kid that looks like the Milky Way galaxy beside their name because they've gotten all of the gold stars. If you're going to go through the Old Testament and you're going to give somebody the most gold stars, it's going to have to be this man by the name of Moses. Moses has been faithful when no one else was faithful. If we're going to use the term Christian to describe an Old Testament saint, by the way, it's incorrect to do that, but we do it all the time. If you're going to use the term Christian to describe an Old Testament saint, Moses isn't just a good Christian. He isn't even a great Christian. He is literally at this moment in human history, the best Christian in the world. No one alive, when you read Numbers chapter 20, has spent more time talking to God. No one alive has spent more time alone with God. No one in their entire life has listened to God personally more times than Moses. No one's done more miracles. No one has spoken more law. No one has accomplished what Moses has accomplished for the Lord. He's not just a good Christian. He's the best Christian on the planet. But Moses in this passage of Scripture, even with all of his gold stars, is going to fail. We have this tendency to believe that if we've been saved for a while, if we've done several good things, if we've served the Lord for a while, that everything else should just be excused for us. How many times have you heard this about an older saint or a, a more mature saint? Let's say it that way. Well, you know, I know he's cantankerous, but that's just the way he is. We're not supposed to be the way we are. We're supposed to be the way he is. And it doesn't matter how long you've been down the road. Sin is still sin. And in this passage of Scripture, this man, Moses, who's been faithful. Remember when he came down out of the mountain with the tablets of stone? And all of a sudden he sees that the children of Israel are practicing idolatry, worshiping a golden calf, saying, this, These be thy gods, O Israel, which deliver thee up from the hand of the Egyptians. They're practicing immodestly. They're living in immorality when he comes down the mountain. And Moses still stands and asks that question, Who is on the Lord's side? Moses stood faithful when Korah and Dathan and Abiram came to him and said, Ye take too much upon you, seeing that all the congregation is holy. They said, Moses, God didn't mean to make you in charge. We're supposed to be in charge. And Moses says, well, tomorrow we'll have a contest. You bring some incense off of the altar, and I'll bring some incense off of my altar, and we'll let God choose who's going to lead the children of Israel. The next day, Korah, Dathan, Abiram, the 250 princes of the Levites show up, and Moses gives them the rest of the contest rules. He gives them the fine print, if you will. He says, if you die some normal death, you'll know I'm not God's man. He said, but if God does some new thing and opens up the earth and swallows you, then you'll know I'm God's man. The earth begins to shake underneath them, all 250 of them, and all that appertaineth unto them went down live into the pit. Here's the funny part of that story. The next day, the next chapter begins this way. The next day came the children of Israel unto Moses and saith unto him, Ye have killed the people of the Lord. Moses didn't kill anybody, number one. Number two, if God opens up the earth and swallows you alive into the pit, you weren't the people of the Lord. It doesn't matter what tribe you were from. 
God's patience runs out. He sends pestilence into the land. They begin to die as fast as you can snap your fingers. And Moses yells to Aaron. And he says, Aaron, run as quickly as your 83-year-old legs will carry you. Go get some incense off the altar and stand between the dead and the living. And we'll see if God will stay the plague. When Aaron gets there, the plague stops, but not until after 14,700 Israelites died that day. Moses has been faithful when they complained about the bread. Our soul loatheth this white bread. Moses has been faithful when they griped about being thirsty. Over and over and over, Moses has been faithful when no one else has. You would think that Moses has so many gold stars on his chart that he can do anything he wants to and not get in trouble. But I'm here to tell you tonight, Christian, if God would judge the best Christian on the planet, which he's going to do in this passage of Scripture. He'll judge you and I for our sin as well. Notice what the Bible says. We'll get Numbers chapter 20. We're going to begin reading in verse 1. The Bible says, Then came the children of Israel, even the whole congregation, into the desert of Zin, and the people abode in Kadesh, and Miriam died there and was buried there. And there was no water for the congregation. They gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. And the people chode with Moses and spake, saying, Would God that we had died uh, uh, when our brethren died before the Lord. And why have you brought up the congregation of the Lord into this wilderness, that we and our cattle should die there? And wherefore have you made us to come up out of Egypt, to bring us into this evil place? It is no place of seed or figs or vines or pomegranates, neither is any water to drink. Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly under the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. They fell upon their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared unto them. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take the rod, and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak unto the rock before their eyes. And it shall give forth his water, and thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock, so thou shalt give the congregation and their beast drink. Moses took the rod from before the Lord, as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock, and he said unto them, Hear now, ye rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice, and the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beasts also. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, Because ye believe me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. Moses is going to commit one sin too many. See, Christian, when you really stop and analyze our own Christian walks, One sin should always be one sin too many. The goal of our life is to be ye holy, even as I am holy, our Savior said. But we have gotten to the place where we have become so accustomed to our own sin, so impressed with our own service of the Lord, that we no longer get broken by one sin too many. Let's have a word of prayer before we begin. Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. Lord, we thank you for our time together in your house. Father, I ask that you bless the message tonight. I ask that you convict hearts tonight as we compare our own lives to the Word of God. Help us, Father, to avoid looking around at everyone else, trying to self-satisfy ourselves by bragging on all of our service for the Lord. But help us, Father, to come face to face with a sin that might even be one that we've dismissed for years. Father, have your will and your way in our hearts tonight. In Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to notice the first couple of verses tell us about the situation. Number one, if you're taking notes, number one, the situation. We're going to divide this up into uh, three different points, but then each one of those points is going to have subpoints. So hold on tight for just a minute, all right? The first thing I want you to see as we look at the situation is the people. Now, you have two groups of people in this passage of Scripture that are polar opposites. They are diametrically opposed. They are antithetical of one another. They could not be any more different if they tried. On one side, you have the children of Israel. On the other side, you have Moses and Aaron. Now, as you look at these two groups, first look with me at the children of Israel. The first thing that jumps off the page at me as I read about them is, number one, they're unpraying people. They're unpraying people. You know, this group of people have already seen God do more miracles concerning water than any group of people in history except those that were alive during the time of Christ. 
They have already watched God turn water to blood and then turn it back from blood into water. They have already watched God part the water of the Red Sea and make it stand up with a wall of water on the left and a wall of water on the right. They've already seen God deliver water out of a rock at an earlier occasion. If there's any group of people that should have known that God can do anything he wants with water, it should be this group of people. So when you get to this place outside of Kadesh and you look around and you see that there's no water there, why didn't someone go, well, there's plenty of sand here, and if God can turn water into blood and blood into water, he can turn sand into water if he wants to. Why didn't they say, well, there's plenty of rocks here, and if God can deliver water out of a rock before, he can do it again. Why didn't they say, let's get together and have a prayer meeting. Let's get some of the men together and pray in groups of two or five or ten or fifty. Let's get some ladies together and have a ladies fellowship and some prayer time. Let's just ask the Lord to deliver water because we know that God can deliver water. But that's not what they do. They don't even think about praying. See, that's one of the problems with me and you, Christian. We don't pray as a first response. We pray as a last resort. We pray when we have tried everything else. We've contacted everyone else that can help us. Then and only then do we finally get down on our knees when it seems like it's absolutely hopeless and ask the Lord for something. We should pray first, but we pray last. These people were unpraying people. It doesn't even cross their minds to pray. Notice, not only the unpraying people, but notice this number two. They're untrusting people. What did they say to Moses? Why did you bring us into this wilderness that we and our cattle should die there? They said, Moses, you have led us into this place where we're all going to die. We're never going to make it to that promised land that you told us about. We're never going to see the milk and honey and the figs and the pomegranates and the grapes. So big it takes two men to carry them on a staff. No, we're never going to see that. We're going to die right here. Why did you put us here? They just don't trust. By the way, when they said things like that, they're not really questioning Moses. The children of Israel aren't going to the promised land because of Moses' promise. They're going to the promised land because of God's promise. Remember what God said in Exodus chapter 3, verses 7 and 8? I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And I am come down to deliver them and to bring them up out of, the, out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good land and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey. They're not going to the promised land because Moses said so. They're going to the promised land because God said so. So when the children of Israel said, Moses... We're just going to die here. What they're really saying is, we just don't trust God to take care of us. These are unpraying people. These are untrusting people. There's something else here. They're unsympathetic people, aren't they? Look at that first verse. There's so much in that first verse. We won't cover it all. Then came the children of Israel, even the whole congregation, the desert is in, in the first month, and the people, uh, and people boating Kadesh, and Miriam died there. Remember Miriam? And was buried there. This is the little girl that watched her baby brother in his bassinet covered with pitch and tar floating down the Nile River that followed him to make sure he was safe. This is the little girl, the little Hebrew slave girl that approached Pharaoh's daughter and said, I know someone that can help you raise that little boy. This is this girl that's older than her two younger brothers, but has been faithful to both of them except for one bout of her own pride a couple of chapters before. But Miriam has been faithful even though her brothers are much younger than she is. This girl is now dead. Moses and Aaron have just said goodbye to the dearest person on the planet to them. And do you notice that the children of Israel don't say, you know, I'm awful thirsty. But shouldn't we give Moses at least a little time to mourn for his big sister? It never even crosses their mind to care for Moses. They are so selfish and so self-centered, they don't care about the man of God at all. I can't give you a Bible verse for this. I can just give you a personal experience. But it's been my experience that the amount of blessings God's going to pour out on any church is commensurate with the amount of blessings and love and honor and compassion and care and respect they pour out on the man of God. Notice these people, the children of Israel, they're unpraying, they're untrusting, they're unsympathetic. The opposite of them are Moses and Aaron. Moses and Aaron come back from the funeral. 
When they come back, the children of Israel chode with them and said, we're thirsty. You brought us here to die. What did Moses and Aaron do? They left the assembly of the congregation. They went to the door of the tabernacle. And what did they do? They fell on their faces. Moses didn't say, well, if you're thirsty, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to develop a blue ribbon committee and we're going to figure out this whole problem. Give us a couple of days and we'll figure out something to do about the... No, he didn't do that. Oh, I've got a plan. There was an oasis back about three miles back. And so even though the pillar of cloud and pillar of fire is going to stay right here, we're going to the oasis. That's what we're going to... No, that's not what he did. He didn't say we're going to divide the whole nation of Israel into three groups. We're going to have three eight-hour shifts. And we're going to dig around the clock. We're just going to keep digging and digging and digging until we finally reach the water table. And that will solve our water... No. The first and only thing Moses did when he's confronted with the fact that there is no water is he fell on his face and began to pray. Call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Jeremiah chapter 33 and verse 3. Luke chapter 11 verses 7 and 8. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth. He that seeketh findeth. Him that knocketh it shall be opened. First Chronicles 16 and verse 11, seek the Lord in his strength, seek his face continually. Isaiah chapter 64 tells us this, and it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. The fact is, Moses knew if you're going to find water where there is no water, God's got to be involved. Moses and Aaron fell on their faces. So on one side, you have the unpraying children of Israel. On the other side, you have the praying Moses and Aaron. On one side, you have the untrusting children of Israel. God tells Moses, go and talk to a rock and water will come out. Now Moses is going to take, depending on your interpretation and the timeline, anywhere from one and a half to three million Israelites. He's going to take one and a half to three million thirsty, complaining, griping Israelites to a rock. God does not tell him what to say. Is Moses supposed to walk up to the rock and go, Hey, nice weather we're having. It's a little dry here. He doesn't even know what to say. Let me ask you a question. What if water doesn't come out of the rock? How long do you think these Israelites are going to let Moses continue to lead lead them? How long do you think it'll be before they reach down there in in the wilderness and start picking up stones and stoning Moses? Moses is risking anything. I know what you're saying. Well, Brother Harper, the Lord told him that water was going to come out of the rock. I understand that. But if the Lord told us that water was going to come out of this flower pot right here, how many of us would run to the kitchen and get a cup? Water doesn't come out of rocks. Water rolls, uh, flows over rocks, around rocks, through rocks, and even under rocks. But it doesn't come out of rocks. So God tells Moses he's going to do something. He's going to do a miracle. And Moses just trusts and doesn't just trust, but takes three million Israelites to watch him trust. On one side, you have the unpraying children of Israel. The other side, you have the praying Moses and Aaron. On one side, you have the untrusting children of Israel. The other side, you have the trusting Moses and Aaron. On one side, you have the unsympathetic children of Israel. Watch what Moses and Aaron do. They come back from their sister's funeral. And everybody says, we're awful thirsty. You better do something about it. And instead of continuing to mourn as the custom would have been, they immediately started taking care of everybody else. How much more selfless do you have to be to put everyone else's needs above your own? The simple truth of the matter is, it's not hard to see who the good guys are and who the bad guys are. It's not hard to see who's serving the Lord and who's doubting the Lord. It's not hard to see who we should be rooting for and who we should be rooting against in this passage of Scripture. As we look at the situation, first we see the people, the unpraying, untrusting, unsympathetic children of Israel, and the praying and trusting and sympathetic Moses and Aaron. Not just the people, but notice number two, the problem. Notice back to that first verse again. Then came the children of Israel, even the whole congregation, into the rainforest of Zin. Doesn't say that. The pasture of Zin. The prairie of Zin, the field of Zin. It doesn't say any of those things, does it? It's the desert of Zin. It's important to realize this, that desert means there's no water there. You don't have to be a geographical genius to know that by the, fa- by the use of the term desert, you're talking about a place that is devoid of moisture. 
And children of Israel did not follow Moses to this desert of Zin. They followed God. Moses isn't leading the children of Israel. They're being led by a pillar of fire during the night and a pillar of cloud during the day. It is God that parked right here in the desert of Zin. And listen to me carefully, Christian. Sometimes God leads us to a place where there is no water. So we're forced to trust him for our next drink. There is a problem. We saw the people. We saw the problem. Look at the prescription, though. I love verse 8. Verse 8, God lays it out. All four steps. Take the rod and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak ye unto the rock before their eyes. Four things. Take the rod, take Aaron, get all the people, and speak to the rock. Very simple. Take the rod, take Aaron, get all the people, and speak to the rock. That is the prescription, and water will come out, and then you can give the congregation and their beasts drink. Notice the situation, the people, the problem, and the prescription. Notice number two, though, the sin. Now, you will have some men that claim to be Bible scholars that will say that Moses' sin here is that he has ruined a type of Christ. Now, first off, let's establish this. Moses does ruin a type of Christ. In the book, in Corinthians, the Bible tells us that Jesus is that rock in the wilderness. He was only smitten once. He wasn't smitten twice. But Moses does not know he is ruining a type of Christ. He has no idea about that. That is not why he's being judged. And by the way, if that is why he is being judged, then why was Aaron judged when Aaron didn't do anything to ruin a type of Christ? See, the reason we want to make this about something like ruining a type of Christ is so it doesn't apply to us. If the passage is about what it's actually about, one man sinning against Almighty God, one man who is told to do one thing and does something else, that applies to every single one of us. Notice a few things, number two, about the sin of Moses. Look at the sin. First off, I want you to know that his temptation is available. His temptation is available. Help me out here for just a moment. I'm going to ask you some questions, and I'm going to ask you to answer out loud. And I realize some preachers do that, and they try to catch you off guard so they can, uh, they can make you feel foolish. I promise we're not going to do that at all. So let's have a practice question and just answer yes or no. Is today Monday? Yes or no? About 75% of you said, it is Monday, I'll say yes. The other 25% said, I know it's Monday, but I also know it's a trick question. No, it's not a trick question. So is today Monday, yes or no? That's a little bit better, all right. So let me ask you some questions about this, about this passage of Scripture specifically. Question number one, did God love Moses? Yes or no? That should be the easiest question you've ever answered in your life as a Christian. Of course, God loved Moses. Secondly, does God want what is best for Moses? Yes or no? Yes. yes. Question number three, does God know the end from the beginning? In other words, does God know what's going to happen next? Yes or no? Yes. Of course he does. Now, don't answer this out loud. Why does verse 8 begin the way it begins? God says to Moses, take the rod. If God loves Moses, and he does. If God wants what's best for Moses, and he does. And if God knows the end from the beginning, if God knows what's going to happen next, why didn't God say to Moses, hey, leave the rod behind this time. Take the rod outside, walk a hundred steps outside the camp, put an X there, dig a hole and put the rod there. Hand the rod to Aaron. Pass the rod around among everybody else. Whatever you do, when you go to that rock, when you and Aaron gather all the people and go to the rock, make sure that rod is not in your hand. Why does God tell Moses to take the rod? We know God does not tempt any man to sin, so this is not God tempting Moses. Why does God tell Moses to take the rod? Why doesn't God tell Moses to leave the rod behind? Because do you realize this? The Bible never promises us a life without temptation. Wouldn't it have been simple for an almighty God, the moment you got saved that quick, to put blinders on and put you in a protective bubble so you could never see temptation again? Could he not have done that? Wouldn't it have been possible for him the moment you got saved to just take you on into heaven and to give you a glorified body? Of course he could have done that. But God never promises us a life without temptation. Now he makes lots of promises about temptation. 
He hath prom- he promises this in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15. We have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was tempted, was tempted in all points like as we, and yet without sin. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 18. In that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. Or 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. There is no temptation taken you, but such is common. But God is faithful, who also with the temptation also make a way of escape that we may be able to bear it. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 4. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4. That which is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world. Even our faith. See God did not promise you a life without temptation. He promised to love you when you're going through the temptation. He promised to understand you when you're going through the temptation. He promised to give you the power to overcome the temptation. He promised to give you the faith to be victorious over the world. And he promised to control the severity of the temptation so you and I will never face a temptation in our lives that we do not have the power to overcome. But God did not tell Moses, leave the rod behind. In this passage of Scripture, Moses' temptation is available. In his hand is the rod. This rod has been used so much for the Lord. But now all of a sudden, it is going to be the instrument that's going to ruin his ministry. Remember, Moses was called to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt and into the promised land. He will never in his natural life set foot in the promised land. Because the rod was in his hand. The temptation was available. Don't we do that as moms and dads? Think about this for just a moment. We do our very best to keep our children from every temptation. If you don't believe in that, then there's a little bit of a problem here. You have some some parents that will say this. Well, you know, they're going to be tempted eventually. Might as well let them get tempted when they're 13. My father-in-law turns 87 this year. I am only 60. I never thought in my life that I would use the word only and then the word 60 after it. But now that I'm 60, I'm only 60. All right? It's just that simple. My father-in-law is 87 almost. You know, there are things that an 87-year-old can say that a 60-year-old can't say. So my father-in-law would look at you, because I could never say this. This is certainly not something that would come out of my mouth unless I'm quoting someone else. If you said to my father-in-law, well... Kids are going to be tempted anyway. Might as well let them get tempted when they're 16. My father-in-law would look at you and say, are you an idiot in any other area? (laughs) Now, now for the record, I didn't say that, all right? I mean, I I didn't say it, so don't try to play it back and say I said that. My father-in-law said it. He's 87. Take it up with him if you want to. The truth of the matter is, Christian, yes, children are going to get tempted. But do you know an 18-year-old is far better, far more equipped to overcome temptation than a 13-year-old is? Our job ought to be to stand at the doorposts and lintels of our house and keep our children away from every temptation we possibly can. Now, if you're doing that, let me tell you, first off, good for you. Praise the Lord. Secondly, that's not enough. Because while you're uh, keeping them away from every temptation possible, you better be teaching them that the only way to truly overcome temptation is through the power of Almighty God. Because there's going to come a time when mommy and daddy can't be there. But God will always be there. His temptation is available there in his hand. Not just that, but his temper is apparent. Can you see, Moses, all these people are gathered around? Sometimes I think we forget that Moses, Abraham, David were all just human beings. Moses has all the same emotions that you and I have. There he is standing there. His heart's still broken because he just lost his sister. He's now a little bit upset that he couldn't even mourn her properly. And he's looking around and seeing all these thirsty Israelites who have been complaining and griping and never satisfied by anything. And he lifts up his rod with that rod in his hand. You can almost see his knuckles turning white as he lifts it up and says to all of them, Here now, you sweet, precious rebels. I don't think he said it like that, do you? Here now, you rebels! Must we fetch you water out of this rock? Why aren't you praying? Why aren't you trusting Almighty God? Why am I treating you like a baby Christian? 
Moses' temper is apparent here. So Brother Harper, how do you know that Moses is angry here? Well, if you study the life of Moses, you find that almost no person in the word of God is more careful to give the Lord the glory every time God does a miracle as Moses is. Except in this passage of scripture, he never mentions the Lord as part of the miracle. Every pastor that I know has had this kind of Moses moment right here. You come to Pastor Monteith's office. Here, you and your wife, you haven't had a kind word for each other in an entire decade. You fight from the time you get up in the morning to the time you go to bed at night. You've tried everything that you can possibly try. And finally, once again, as a last resort, you say, well, let's go talk to the pastor. At first, you both disagree. You both argue, well, we don't want him to know that there's a problem. But finally, you actually get up and you make an appointment and you come to his office. There you are in his office, and I've been in his office, and you say, listen, we've been fighting. We fight over our family. We fight over our finances. We fight over our future. There is nothing that we do not fight about, and we really need help. I know your pastor well enough to know that he's not going to reach on his bookshelf and open up a book by Dr. Phil. He's going to open up, he's going to open up his Bible. He's probably going to turn to Ephesians chapter 5. And every husband in this auditorium, if you've ever been in that situation, at first you're sitting there under your breath, you're saying amen. You wish you had a hanky so you can wave it and shout glory when he looks at your wife and says, Wives, be in subjection unto your husbands as unto the Lord. Husband saying, it's about time somebody told her that. Then all of a sudden he's going to look at the husband and say, oh, by the way, you're supposed to love her as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And the wife is sitting there going, mm hmm, I've been saying that for a while. But then he's going to look at both of you and say, but listen carefully. If he loves you the way he's, if he doesn't love you the way he's supposed to love you, you're still supposed to be in subjection. And if she's not still in subjection, you're supposed to still love her the way you're supposed to love her. One does not have any bearing on the other. But it's a lot easier to be in subjection to a man that loves you like Christ loved the church. And it's a lot easier to be in, it's a lot easier to love a woman who's in subjection unto you as unto the Lord. What I'm saying is the plan works perfectly together. It's just not easy. Two things about Bible advice. Number one, it's always the right advice. Number two, it's never the easy advice. He lets you both have it. For about 15 to 20 minutes, he tells you what's wrong with your marriage, how to fix your marriage, and how to do it God's way. As you get up and leave his office, before you even get to the parking lot, the husband looks at the wife and says, I don't know about you, but that was a little drastic, don't you think? The wife says, I was thinking the same thing. And for a moment, the clouds part. A rainbow is in the sky because for the first time in 10 years, you agree on something. You both agree that pastor was wrong. <laughs> you go home, you download the latest offering from Dr. Phil. You put it into practice. One day goes by, and by the end of that first day, you're fighting again. You're fighting about everything. Now you're fighting about what Dr. Phil meant when he wrote what he wrote. You're fighting about every single thing. Two weeks of nonstop fighting go by. You go back to pastor's office. You say, preacher, we still don't have peace in our home. We've only agreed on one thing in the last 10 years and two weeks. You don't tell him that the only thing you agreed on was that he's incorrect. Finally, pastor looks at you and he says, did you do what I told you to do? And you look down and you draw little figure eights with your shoes and you say, you know, we thought that was a little drastic. So we tried something else. Every pastor that I know at that moment, would like to reach out with his right hand and lay it gently on the left side of your neck. Then reach out with his left hand and lay it gently on the right side of your neck. And then squeeze and say, here now, rebel, I can preach it. I can teach it. I can practice it. I can counsel it. But I can't come home and make you do it. That's what Moses is saying here. I have trusted the Lord for all of these years so far. I've trusted him coming up out of Egypt. I've trusted him in the wilderness. I've trusted him every time we've had a shortcoming in food or in water. Every time we've been in a battle, I've trusted the Lord. But I can't make you do it. Do I have to fetch you water? Out of this rock. Moses is literally saying here, you pray to the same God I pray to. Why do I have to treat you like a child and get you a sippy cup full of water before you go to bed? Notice Moses, number one, his temptation is available in his sin. Number two, his temper is apparent. But this one's huge to me. His teammate is absent. 
Remember what the Lord said in verse 8? Take the rod and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother. So let me just ask you a simple question. Where was Aaron? Oh, he helps Moses gather everyone together. The Bible tells us that. Look, if you will, please. It's verse, verse, uh, uh, verse uh, 9. And Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock. So there is Aaron standing beside of Moses. Aaron looks over and sees Moses gripping that rod tighter and tighter, gritting his teeth just a little bit, anger in his eyes, a furrowed brow. He lifts that rod over his head and he says, Here now, you rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? Where was Aaron? Why doesn't Aaron step forward and say, <clears throat> Excuse me, Moses, God said to speak to the rock this time, not to hit it. Why doesn't Aaron look at Moses and say, hmm, I think somebody needs a time out. Remember in Exodus chapter, seven, chapter 14, when they're battling the Amalekites and Aaron and Hur stood on either side of Moses and held his hands up? Why doesn't Aaron step in and say, stop? Aaron just stands there and does nothing. Now listen, Christian, you'll never hear me give you permission from a pulpit, from counseling or anything to be a busybody, stick your nose where it doesn't belong, on down the list for all those little colloquialisms. But I'm telling you this, if you're standing there and you're watching someone about to ruin their family, their testimony or their ministry, and you say absolutely nothing, you're every bit as guilty as Aaron is. Brother Harper, wait a minute. If Aaron steps in and stops Moses from hitting that rock, don't you think it would have embarrassed Moses? Absolutely. But don't you think that 40 years later, as Aaron and Moses stand on the other side of the Jordan River and shout on the last day, on the last trip around Jericho and watch the walls fall down, don't you think Moses would have looked at Aaron and said, Hey, big brother. Thanks for not letting me hit that rock back there in the wilderness. A few years ago, we went to Michigan. I was going to preach a revival for a young pastor. We preached three revivals for him already. A very young couple, got growing. It was his, uh, he had a small church in Philadelphia. Now he's uh, pastoring a church. The Lord was doing a great work there. We pulled our trailer there and we uh, uh, preached Sunday morning and Sunday night. And then Monday morning, I walked over to the church just to talk to him for a few moments. And I noticed that he was in his office with the door closed with his secretary. No windows, nothing like that. For a couple hours, they were in there. Tuesday, the same thing. Wednesday, the same thing. Thursday, I waited until the secretary came out, and I went in and talked to him. And I said, Preacher, you know I love you. We've been friends a long time. I said, but you're letting your good be evil spoken of. You're not avoiding the appearance of evil. I said, I don't believe anything's going on in this office with the door closed and no windows, but it sure looks like something could be. And he looked at me. I'll never forget what he said, Preacher. He said, you have just ruined our friendship. I can't believe you don't trust me. That night we had the service. She didn't even speak to me. The pastor didn't even speak to me. During the fellowship uh, song, he went the opposite direction. All day Friday, didn't even see him. We got up that morning. There was a little note on the door with some money in it. Go get your own lunch. We're not going to lunch with you today. That night he didn't speak to me, didn't say goodbye, didn't say anything. We left on Saturday Hadn't heard a word. About four months later, we received a phone call from his wife. She called on my phone. My wife answered. She wanted to speak to me. You never want to get a phone call from a pastor's wife if you're an evangelist. My wife gets phone calls from pastor's wives. I don't. If a pastor's wife calls me, it's for one of two reasons. Please pray for my husband. He's very sick. That's not good news. Or please, please pray for my husband. He's gone the wrong direction. This woman was calling me because her husband was found out to be having an affair in his office with the door closed. It was, however, not, I will say this, with the secretary. She said, we found out about two weeks ago. She said, I asked him last night because he's not talked to anybody. She said, is there anybody at all that you'd be willing to talk to? 
And he said, Brother Harper, because he's the only one that loved me enough to warn me. To this day, we're still friends. The truth of the matter is, you stand idly by like Aaron. You're every bit as guilty as he is. Notice number one, we saw the situation. Number two, we saw the sin. Number three, I want you to see the supply. This is amazing, all right? Let's assume that you and I can go back in time. We show up in the desert of Zin. There we are, and we watch verse 11 take place. We haven't been there for verses 1 through 10, but we're there for verse 11. Because we're Americans, even though there are 3 million Israelites in front of us, we kind of elbow our way, and we get up to the front because we want a front row seat. And we watch Moses lift up his hand with his rod. He smote the rock twice. And the water came out abundantly. What would every single one of us have said at that moment? Wow. God sure is blessing Moses. Look at that miracle Moses just did. We have gotten to the place where we're, we almost completely assume that anything big must be right with God. It's just not in the Word of God. A.W. Tozer said this. He said, you preach the Word whether it fills the house or whether it empties it. The simple truth of the matter is, we would have looked at the outward manifestation. We would have looked pragmatically at it and said, well, water doesn't come out of rocks. Water just came out of rocks. Only water can deliver water out of rocks. So Moses must be doing everything right. Listen, God did not send water out of that rock because of Moses. He sent water out of that rock in spite of Moses. God sent water out of that rock because he always intended to send water out of that rock. That's why he led them to the desert in the first place. Now here, we would all assume that everything must be perfect. Isn't that what happens to us though, Christian? Think about it. You come to the church on Sunday morning, a couple hundred people here, you sing the songs of Zion, you hear the word of God preached without apology, without compromise, you have fellowship with brothers and sisters in Christ, then you go home, you turn on your television set, you find a preacher who doesn't preach the same way or the same Bible that your pastor preaches, and you look around and you say, but look, there's 25,000 people there. God sure is blessing. God blesses one thing, His word. If it's in here, He'll bless it. If it's not in here, he won't. You can mag uh, manufacture things all day long, but don't assume that because someone is disobedient to God that they're receiving the blessings of Almighty God. Moses isn't getting blessed here. Moses is being judged here. Notice the situation. Number two, the sin. Number three, the supply. Number four, the scolding. Now, verse 12. First, look at the end of verse 11 with me because there is a huge time lapse between the middle of verse 11 and the bit, first part of verse 12. Moses lifted up his hand with his rod. He smote the rock twice. And the water came out abundantly. Now watch this. And the congregation drank and their beasts also. Moses gathered all the congregation together, not the beasts so in other words, every one of the one and a half to three million Israelites got something to drink. Then they all had time to go back, get all of their animals, and herd all their animals over to where the water was flowing so that all of their animals could get something to drink. This is hours that have taken place. Moses had plenty of time, just like God gives me and you, to have gotten right. Moses should have said, I shouldn't have hit that rock, Lord. I'm sorry I disobeyed. I don't know what would have happened had Moses done that, except I do know this, he would have been forgiven. I don't know if there would have still been consequences after the forgiveness, but there, he would have been forgiven because he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Moses should have said, I shouldn't hit that rock, forgive me, Lord. But if he's like us, he said, you know, I shouldn't hit that rock. But at least I prayed more than that family did. At least I trusted more than that family did. At least I cared for others better than that family did. Now the Lord speaks to Moses. He says, you're not going to bring this congregation into the land that I've promised them. You're not going to see it. Oh, I'll show it to you. But you won't step foot in the promised land in your natural life. Moses is not going to the promised land. 
everyone that was under the age of 20 in Numbers chapter, 20, uh, chapter 14, even though they didn't pray, they didn't trust, and they weren't sympathetic, they're going to watch Jericho's walls fall down. They're going to watch the Jordan River part. They're going to watch the sun stand still, but Moses won't see it. You know what Moses did to miss the promised land? It must have been a big sin, right? Surely he had another God before God. He took God's name in vain. He made a graven image. No. He didn't honor his mother and father, didn't keep the Sabbath day. Maybe he killed somebody or bore false witness or committed adultery or coveted. I wonder which one of those major sins Moses committed. You know what Moses did to miss the promised land? Now watch carefully. Let me help you here. He hit a rock with a stick. That's not the 11th commandment. Thou shalt not hit a rock with thy stick. No, it's not in there. Say, Brother Harper, that's not that big a sin when you look at it. No. And let me, let me challenge you. Is there a single person in this auditorium, anyone, any born again child of God that hasn't disobeyed God worse than this today? Moses misses the promised land because he disobeyed God. Didn't matter how many gold stars he had. Didn't matter how many times he'd been faithful because to whom much is given, much shall be required. But the harper, it's not fair that God expected more from Moses than everybody else. No, it's his word. It is fair because it's what God said. He's going to expect more from you when he gives you more blessings. How about Aaron? Do you know what Aaron did to miss the promised land? This will blow your mind. Watch me carefully. I'm going to show you exactly what Aaron did to miss the promised land. Ready? Do you realize in this passage of Scripture, Aaron does everything he's commanded to do. But to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. God holds Aaron every bit as accountable as he holds Moses. Don't tell me you can stand by and watch someone destroy their testimony and say nothing and think you're going to get by with it. You look at this passage of Scripture, you find Moses chastised by Almighty God even after this. Understand this. Even after this sin, Moses is still the best Christian on the planet. Aaron is still number two. But they're not going into the promised land because they committed one sin too many. Our problem is, Christian, we take such a light view of our own sin. By the way, we don't take a light view of anybody else's sin. We're real quick to point out everyone else's shortcomings. But when it comes time to examine our own hearts... That's when we decide, well, I sure do have a, gold, a lot of gold stars. God will just have to settle with this sin. You know what we all are, Christian? We're all just a bunch of rock hitters. Maybe we should do what Moses didn't do and get it right. Every Christian's committed one sin too many. Every lost person has committed one sin too many, haven't they? By the way, you were a sinner before you sinned. You were born a sinner. The Bible tells us, therefore, it is by one man sin into the world, and death by sin, so that death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. You were a sinner before you committed your first sin. One sin too many took place, and it's only one sin that will keep you out of heaven. No sin is allowed there. But you can trust Christ tonight as your personal Savior. If you'll ask him, here's the thing about it. He won't just forgive the sins you've committed today. He'll, he'll forgive you all of your sin. If you just ask. He'll wash them in his own blood, like we sang right before the message. There's power in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb. Won't you trust him tonight? If you're a Christian, it's time to stop looking at everyone else's sin as if they're terrible. And bragging about our gold stars. It's time for us to be broken because we're a bunch of rock hits.